Everybody, we got some stupendous news. We're finally a young and hip podcast. Uh, thanks to Florian Kleinu, Dr. Florian Kleinu. We are finally doing a show on Carl Gustav Jung. We've been running Talknosis, it preexisted before me for over a decade now, yet somehow we've neglected this incredible thinker who's been influential on so much modern Gnostic thought, and Jung himself said that classic Gnostic thought was an influence on him. Florian, thanks so much for coming on. But can you give us the overview? Who was Jung? Well, historically, uh, worked at the turn of the 20th century, so... Uh, he was a student of Sigmund Freud. Originally, he was a, a student of medicine by Freud. Um, he studied with Freud and sort of continued to develop his notions of the unconscious, where he um, ultimately went on to split from Freud over some key concepts that I'm sure we'll, we'll go on to touch upon um, later. Uh, he then sort of continued along different trajectories from Freud entirely. Um, but but that's sort of the realm he was in. He was also a psychoanalyst. He drew heavily upon the notions of the unconscious. Um, and, well, he was Swiss. I think maybe that's a... For, for those who don't know anything about Jung, he was Swiss. Um, and spent his life living in, in Switzerland. Extremely awesome. And Jung has had a, a big impact on our culture, a big impact on many important thinkers, uh, very influential on many artists. But at the same time, I, I don't know if I would exactly call him mainstream. Uh, how, how did you get interested in him and his work? Yeah. Yeah, it's, I, don't, I don't quite remember myself. I was interested in Taoism um, at, a, at a quite a young age. I lived in China for a while, um, for a couple of years. Um, after I graduated high school, I moved to um, Beijing and, and lived there for a few years to learn, to learn Chinese initially, and then I stayed to work. And, um, at that time I was reading, I was reading Taoist texts. I was reading the Yijin, I was reading the Tao Te Ching and uh, Jung wrote a, an introduction to the Yijin, um, and a commentary on another, uh, Taoist text, the, um, text of the golden flower or whatever it's translated as in English. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I my, my mother tongue is German. I read most of this stuff in German. Um, but that sort of got me interested in, in, in his thinking and the, the whole idea sort of of the Tao. Very similar to Jung's worldview with the sort of the synchronicity as sort of the background noise of, um, you know, reality, if you will. Um, that got me, got me interested in Jung. I, I first read, um, his, his works on, on alchemy and, and then later getting sort of more systematic, you know, psychoanalysis, psychology, um, while I studied, I did study neuroscience and psychology in undergrad. So that was, um, sort of a little loop around the corner that got me back to Jung then. Yeah, that, that's, that's really cool. Uh, usually in English, it's translated as "secret of the golden flower," though I, I've seen some, some different different titles for it. Yeah, okay. and I'm sure I'm sure we'll be talking uh, more about that uh, as well. Uh, but it, uh, it's a Taoist manual for inner alchemy, so very fascinating text that um, uh, Jung got a lot out of, and uh, people can get a lot of, out of uh, today. But yeah, I didn't realize that the Taoism was was your uh, was your entry point. That's that's really really interesting. Um, okay, so uh, if you can take us through some of his his major ideas, uh, the, sort of a huge question. Uh, some of these ideas can be very complex, but uh, the, again, the, the overview, which I guess we got to start with the big one, which uh, is which is an idea that he builds upon, but the the unconscious. Right, right. So I think the starting point here, and I, I guess schools of psychoanalysis disagree on this already, but. Um, the starting point is that we, if we're born either with, um, nothing at all or with an ego, um, uh, and then either the unconscious grows or as Jung puts it, the, or the unconscious form, or as Jung puts it, um, we're born sort of into a space, um, that is unconscious, collective unconscious for Jung. And then from that, the, what we call the ego differentiates, or as Jung says, sort of in the first phase of individuation, individuate or start to differentiate, right? And a personal unconscious then develops as well. So your SD Jung proposes two layers essentially um, of the unconscious. So you have, if you will, the ego or the or the, just the realm of consciousness um, of which the ego is the core, and and then you have sort of the personal unconscious as a layer below this below below this ego beneath this ego, to an extent formed by this ego and the collective unconscious as Jung hypothesizes as a realm that we're born into that is sort of pre preeminent where it's, it precedes us, if you will. Um, so that's the very basic 
um, very basic architecture. You have um, then the ego again, uh, sort of obviously has unconscious components. We can maybe talk a little more about that. So the ego is as being, um, let's say, not entirely its own agent. It's controlled sort of by these unconscious factors. And then, of course, the ego, that's sort of at the bottom layer, if you will, of the ego. And then at the top layer of the ego, we have the stone house of the the mask that we wear in, or the mask in, in plural that we wear in multiple sort of social situations to sort of interact with society on that level. But, but yeah. we'll, yes, we'll, we'll get into each of those in more detail. Excellent, excellent. Well, yeah, that's just what I was about to say. Is I think a lot of people at home who, who maybe don't know Jung, um, they're nodding along. You know, this makes sense. I know about the unconscious or at least ideas of the subconscious and the ego or persona. That sounds rational, elegant. I've had some personal experience out in my own life and counseling, even if they are not uh, uh, connected in any way to, to psychoanalysis or any school of psychoanalysis. But you mentioned the collective unconscious there a few times. That might be an idea that that blows some people's minds. That, that might even be difficult to to accept. So, can you tell us yeah. more about Jung's series of the collective unconscious? What it is, how it works? Uh, yeah, th- fill us in. I think I think maybe let's start with the you know, the personal unconscious to sort of ease out the differences here. So, if we think about the personal unconscious, what we would classically think about in the sort of Freudian view is that basically there are, there are um, aspects of the life that we live that we cannot cope with or that for some other reason are split from the ego. Now, to understand that, we have to sort of think about, okay, what is the ego? Essentially, I always like to say the ego is the kind of the story that we tell about ourselves in a way, right? We narrate, I, I like to think of the ego as kind of a narrative um, that has to do with the, the work in psychology that I've been doing. Um, and I think it fits well with the own, but anyways, the ego is sort of the, so that which we believe we are. And although we cannot recall all of it, I, I also like to compare it to the photo library that we have on our phones. Like you can go through it and you'll find, you will ultimately find what you're looking for, but there are gaps, right? And some pictures you deleted, maybe some pictures, other people have deleted, some pictures were, let's say, automatically deleted in a way, you know, um, by, by accident, by your phone in the metaphor, you know, and, and the pictures that are sort of the gaps, so that which is not there, it's what we will call, and especially those pictures that are deleted purposefully, um, in quotation marks, right? Repression, well, purposeful action, obviously, um, that would be sort of cast into the unconscious, right? That's the personal unconscious. Right now, the ego yeah. then is, is sort of that which you build very precisely built around, um, that which makes those pictures hang together, the kind of the story you build. And, and again, you have the reference book, you can say, oh, well, I have this, I have this pain in my knee. Oh, actually, it's because yesterday I tripped over the stuff like that. And if you can build this, you know, the pain doesn't have to disturb you so much because you can interpret it. You can build an interpretive framework, starting with the very fundamental assumption that you're a functioning body that is sort of the same today and tomorrow. And so, so this, this is a more, very broad understanding, I think, of, of sort of what, what we can understand the ego. Now, the unconscious then, the personal unconscious, again, we've discussed this, this repository of repressed um, content. Um, to a large extent. Now, the collective unconscious for Jung is, um, to put it, put out a hypothesis here or a statement that we can discuss is the, the fundament of all reality, if you will. So physical reality on the one hand, and then, um, I think reality on the other hand. And I, I like to think of the collective unconscious as that, which the structures or gives you the, or affords you the trajectory along which you can, you can then build, um, let's say it exists in psychological distance and in some interpretation, you know, physical existence. Now, um, maybe to fill that with life a little bit, um, essentially the way I like to think about the psyche is that again, you have these different small elements that you grasp, you know, that you sort of take in, right? Those elements could be compared to the books behind me on the shelf, you know, it's like these different elements and those elements have to somehow be organized within, within your psyche, in the realm of the psyche. And Jung proposes that the collective unconscious offers you a, a space in which those elements can be organized preeminently. Now, offer sounds like you have a choice. In fact, you don't, right? It's what you're born with. And this doesn't mean as a little bit of, um, you say, well, anyways, it doesn't mean that you don't, that this collective realm doesn't evolve. Let's just say that from, from you know, it doesn't mean that it's fixed. It's, it's always been the same. You inherited in quotation marks, um, but it's, 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 um, 
it, it is an evolving the realm for young as well. But I, did, but, uh, I, I really want to, uh, I hope you weren't in a groove. I, I just want to put a, a little p- pinpoint in that because I, I think that is a, a big misunderstanding about young thought or like pop culture understanding of young thought. So I just want to highlight that as, as, as very important because it's something that I have encountered a lot. So, 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 so sorry, Florian, you were on a roll and I, I got in there. Oh, it's very, please interrupt me. It's, it's, and I think to, to stay with the pop culture, I think I haven't mentioned the archetypes at all. Um, and, and that's sort of on purpose, in a way on purpose, because I think the archetypes are there. We have to make a differentiation very early if we think about the archetypes and that's, you have archetypal images and that would be, um, something like the, you know. The, the Jack Sparrow as a trickster figure, for example, and, and in, in Pirates of the Caribbean, that's a, that, that would be an archetypal image. It would not be an archetype, right? It would be the archetype would be the, 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 sort of, again, the nucleus around which such images may cluster within the life, sort of the shell itself, right? The shelf that we see would be the, the archetype, if we say, if we, if we want to say that one. So the trajectories, when I say trajectories, that's what you want to refer to as the archetypes. And you have certain trajectories that are quite fundamental, like the relationships to our parents, for example, it's a very fundamental archetype. Um, but what I always like to use as an entry point to sort of get people thinking about archetypes is think about instincts, right? Instincts are quite, quite simple and quite natural to us. You know, the bird will build a nest in the, in the, in the head. In the, in the garden rather than the tree, you know, and the bird doesn't think about, oh, I want to build this, this nest here today. Um, or maybe I want to build it in, in the, in the barn, you know, the bird either builds a nest in the barn or under the roof or in the hedge or in the tree. And that's sort of an instinctual movement because this is where maybe this sort of mystical unity side comes in on a very simple level, because it has, they co-evolved to stay in terminology that people like co-evolve with nature in a way that nature provides exactly the space and the bird comes into the space and, and together they, they, they create this quality that we then call sort of an archetypal action or an archetypal gesture. And, um, right. I think, I think maybe that, that to sort of briefly describe the collective unconscious, um, yeah. 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 Uh, that's amazing. And, and I think that's a very succinct. Uh, explanation. It's very clear. I think people are going to be able to to grasp it if, if they're not uh, haven't been exposed to this idea before. Because again, not to beat a dead horse, keep bringing this up. The the, the way the collective unconscious is often presented, if you do want to cross it, is uh, the confusing, uh, complicated, overly mystical. Uh, but I think it, the way that that you phrase it is excellent. So so thanks so much. Um, and uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I think the mystical experience is precisely, um, the sort of the effect of archetypal images can have on us. Right. I mean, Jung says it was very clearly, you know, the unconscious, I don't know if people are familiar or if you're familiar, you're probably familiar with it, with Rudolf Otto's, um, book on the holy, um, and, and Otto describes sort of the effect, effects of the holy on the, sort of in, in the Christian context in, on the, on the, on people, I think in general, not only on believers. He describes and you know, the, the feeling you have when you walk into a church and you hear the choir singing, the organ playing, or, or simply witness the, the sort of, and then he, he uses the term, the tremendous, um, force of the tremendous, he, he calls it the tremendum of the sort of the, the church that is upon you, let's say. And archetypes are experienced in a similar way, you know, Otto uses the term numinist, um, that, that Jung then, uh, uh co op um, to describe the experience of the arch of the archetypal. And I think. One reason for that is because the archetypes are in a way, a space of familiarity. You know, I always like to think of it, um, as this moment, you realize that there is a lot more than you and you're, there's an element of fear, but there's an element of comfort, you know, and it's the story you had goosebumps, I get goosebumps right now. You have goosebumps because there's this, there's this, this, just this feeling of connectedness. I don't mean this in sort of a new age way, but it simply does. You know, the, the, the collective unconscious, the archetypes again are shared and inherited and they're shared by, by not only the past, but by the present and the future. So, you know, there's, you are part of something that's greater, something that's evolving, something that's, that's always going to be there. And I think the sort of luminosity and maybe the bird feels a luminosity when, when the bird builds the nest in the tree, you know, when, when it, when they discover 
and that the first time, well, this is, this is a, this is, this is where I should build a nest. You know? Maybe, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's awesome. And, and at the same time, while I'm being kind of critical of this, uh, the, some of these interpretations, understandings, misunderstandings of collective unconscious, I, I don't want to completely scientize it because of course, um, uh, Jung had a very deep relationship with religion, with mysticism, with myth, the importance of myth. And even if you don't know Jung, people are, are probably kind of figuring out that the, the archetypes of collective unconscious are related to some of our uh, ideas about religion, our experiences of religion, like you're saying, of the numinous. And, and the archetypes are, are often connected to the figures that we find in myth, fairy tale, fiction. Is, is that right? Yeah. So essentially, Jung called all of these um, sources that you just described products of the psyche. But for him, his main source was precisely this um, material. So, um, of course, also casework. There's a lot of many volumes in his collective works about with casework, especially dreams and, um, you know, and free associations that were technically Jung developed, um, in, of course, the therapeutic work. Um, but especially prominent, and I think this is the main difference between him and other schools of psych psychoanalysis, psychology in general, are these products of the psyche. Essentially what he says is, look, this is what humans wrote. This is what the psyche produced in a specific date, in a specific perhaps um, moment. He, he always says these archetypal texts or the archetypes themselves grew in a time where consciousness was still in its sort of baby shoes. I don't know if this makes sense in English, but it was yeah. still very... The light was very uh, uh, dark, you know, the light of consciousness, the metaphor. It was very, it wasn't very, again, because perhaps I have to say this, sorry, maybe this is a bit confusing, but consciousness doesn't only develop within the lifespan of the individual, right? You from this, from this darkness of the unconscious, you develop and unfold a, a um, sort of a light in order to then build a relationship with the darkness around you, right? That's sort of an image that you own, um, the two phases of the individuation process, but Consciousness also historically develops, and um, and Jung proposes that there was a time where consciousness was not as strong as now, and it sort of develops. And he's very critical of this development. He sees that, you know, many of the catastrophes that um, that you know he witnessed in his lifetime in the 20th century um, in Europe were are connected to precisely this sort of the the hubris or the um, of, of the of, of the ego, because the ego precisely has to maintain this relationship with the darkness around it. Well, we can get to this later, maybe. Yeah, um, yeah it's uh, it's, it's well, it's basically, it's basically my next question, but I, I think I, I think that, that that's an awesome explanation. And and yeah, so you're talking about the light, you're talking about the dark. Uh, what what is the shadow for for Jung? So the shadow essentially, very sort of um, um, succinctly, is the the shadow that is cast by the light. Yeah, you know, and the light in this case would be consciousness, would be the ego. So that which the ego cannot work with within its narrative would be cast in the shadow. Now, for some, the shadow is sort of the 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 shadow is a a metaphor for what we would call the personal consciousness, actually this repressed content. But Jung also says that the shadow reaches down all the way to hell, you know. And and this means that the shadow has two aspects. It has the personal aspect and the collective aspect. Now the purple aspect of it, again, we could say are at least elements of this, these repressed memories. Now, not all of them, but especially for young, this sort of the, those elements that are threatening to the, to sort of the stability of the ego, if you will. But then on the other hand, um, there's an element to society where the shadow is, um, repressed as certain, often it's weaknesses, you know, often it's fears. Um, often it's societal, sort of that which you deny to be in society. Um, so, so that could be that those are aspects of the shadow. Now the shadow, I think what many people may think of, I'm not sure, but, but, um, is yeah. sort of the shadow in a projected state. So often you say, for example, um, oh, you know, your neighbor, he probably has, you know, he probably, um, uh, tortures his cat. I don't know, like, you know, probably an evil person or whatever um the 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 whole notion that you would put forth is well look why do you think that is true have you ever witnessed him um torturing a cat probably not now does he sort of um did he ever make any gestures did he even mention it probably not now why do you think he tortured cat would you like to torture a cat you know what I mean? or or maybe have you tortured a cat so it's this sort of this projection this sort of outward again projection quite literally 
um, of shadow elements happens on a social level as well. Now, certain certainly groups are, are uh, you know, are um, uh, victims of shadow projection all the time. You know, that was for young, for, for example, the, the whole Holocaust of the, the, was a shadow, shadow projection protection marks of the German people on the, on the Jews. So that, that was, that's a quite interesting, um, and relatable. I always, I always like to, um, and now you can think of all this, so sort of all the attributes that are attributes of, you know, such forms of people. And now it's important also to say that every light casts a shadow. Yeah. Maybe one more word about the shadow, um, in relation to Jung's function, psychological functions. Now, I don't think this is something we'll get into very much, but Jung proposed certain cognitive functions to be at work in, um, in the psyche and there, for example, you can say on a very basic level, you're extroverted. There's an extrovert introvert sort of, um, field within which people score and, and pre all these functions are always present. So ex every person's always extrovert, introverted. You're never just an extrovert, but you're both. So one of those functions would be sort of more in the shadow than the other. And now these, this function that's more in the shadow of the other than the other is precisely the function that's sort of where you're most, um, let's say vulnerable at. So whenever you sort of have a conversation with someone and you, um, you say something and you strike a nerve, let's say, you know, that you, you fit something, um, relevant there, so getting the shadow, something that they can still cast light on, right? But ultimately you can cast a light on that. Something else will fall into the shadow again. So that's. Right. Uh, uh, an important question I, I forgot to put on the sheet uh, flow, but uh, I, I know you can go with the flow and, and probably be able to speak eloquently on this, which is uh, the synchronicity. You know, what, what, what is a synchronicity? Right. So a synchronicity in essence is sort of an a causal, the recurrence of an a causal moment, um, within time. Now, what that means is you have two instances. Typically we say, um, one instance would be in a site, one psychological, another material, and they're somehow connected by meaning, but they're not causally connected. So you, for the classical example would be, for instance, um, the, the example that, that, um, that, um, Jung had a patient where I think I, I talked about this before, Jung had a patient where, um, that, that he was seeing, it was a man and, and this man was seeing him and talked and his wife told him, I think the day before, so the wife of the man who was his patient told him the, the day before, oh, he has heart issues, maybe you can have a look at him. And, um, so Jung had to look at him and say, I said, I sent him to the cardiologist, no problem. Uh, everything's fine. He's on his way back home. And, um, and no, yeah. So the wife called and said, well, is everything all right with him? Are you sure? Saying this to Jung. And, and he was like, he's on his way home. Everything's great. And why, and Jung asked, why did you call? Well, there was a flock of bird on my, um, on my house. And I, every time a member of my family died, it happened to her twice with her mother and a grandmother, I think, um, there was a bird, there were birds on my, on my roof. So I was very, I was worried. He's like, no, no, it's fine. And it turned out that in this precise moment, not precise yeah. moment, but around that time, the man had had a heart attack and died. Um, mm -hmm. here. and now uh, why is the synchronicity? You have a connection between the birds and the death of the person, right? A lot. Now, both of these occurrences are, 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 are physical, if you will, but the meaningful connection between this is on multiple levels. First, you have a personal level. The woman had experienced, um, the connection between these two, uh, occurrences before. But then, and this is quite interesting, you have an archetypal level where the bird, um, is a symbol for, um, sort of a soul leaving or entering a body rather is an archetypal image. You have this sort of in, in many amazing for Egypt, the Bible as well. So, um, the reason why this is a called the, again, a synchronistic experience is because these two occurrences appear in conjunction with each other, they don't have to occur at the same time and they don't have to occur in the same place. It's very important. Um, um, strictly speaking, they could occur, you know, one event could occur in, you know, it could be a window breaking here in, in Germany and, um, someone, something else happening in, in the United States or Canada, um, would still be a synchronistic moment if there was some kind of meaningful connection between those events. And these events could also be displaced in time, would still be synchronistic if there was a meaningful connection. Um, th th we're talking about Jung, but, but a little Freudian slip. I, I wrote, what is integration on the question sheet? I think I meant to write what is individuation, but you know, I'll ask both. Hey, hey, what is integration and individuation, Florian? 
Like it's conjunctive, actually. I mean, we can talk about integration in the context of individuation, perhaps. So this individuation essentially has, um, well, it literally involves in integrating the conscious and the unconscious components of the psyche. So individuation has essentially two phases. There is the phase of uh, the first phase of like half of life, Jung says, although it doesn't have to be half. And I don't believe that these two phases are just distinct on a global level. But anyway, the first, the first phase is the phase where the ego essentially differentiates from, and now we have to introduce a new term from self. Now, what is the self? The self is essentially the objective core of the psyche. Jung says that the ego is the subjective core of the psyche. Now, again, the story you tell about yourself, the narrative you have, while the self is the objective core of the psyche connected, as you may have guessed, to the collective unconscious. Now, the self is sort of the, if you think about it as a, the surface of water, the self would reach down into the collective unconscious while the ego stays in consciousness and to some extent in the collective unconscious. So the self is essentially your, your, your pathway into the collective, your connect your, and the self and the ego, again, have, um, a connection and this connection in the first first moment in the, when you're born is the self is entirely wrapped around the ego. So the ego is not differentiated from the self. Now we said earlier, the ego is not differentiated from the collective unconscious. And these terms are used interchangeably the only, you could say the self is sort of the, describes the whole of the psyche, everything there is. Now, over time, the ego, you know, breaks out of the self, just like the child sort of breaks out of the, so both the connection to its mother and its, and its father to that extent, but more its mother. And that's also why Jung sometimes speaks of this, this first moment of the Uvobolos, the Uvobolic state, where you're literally encompassed by this wound like any, everything in a way. Now there's a differentiation going on. The ego differentiates, breaks, breaks apart from the cell and, and the fools that are break between them would be sort of the final achievement of the first half of individuation, if you will. Now the second part of individuation, the second phase. Um, requires a reconnection of the ego to the self. And that is precisely the work that we talk about when we say integration. First half is more concerned with, you know, building a, a stance in society, you know, getting a job, blah, 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 all that. But, but essentially building a strong narrative of who you are, a strong protective shield, let's say against trauma, which is considered ego, sort of ego death, you know, like literally literal certain elements in your ego being ruptured. So being attacked, if you will, by, by what I call negative judgment. So when people say, oh, the dogs are actually bad, but you think dogs are great. And I mean, if you're a part of you, you know, you're not, the world's not going to be shattered, you know, and, and for a child that happens, you your children, you know, like you say, no, you can't have the ice cream. Your, their world breaks down there, but <laughs> you know, understand the way more, but in any case, um, the second part is more related than to integrating the shadow, for instance, um, integrating, dealing with, um, working through, you may say, other archetypal, um, figures, the anima is an important anima animals are important for the entry point into the unconscious, but it's essentially about integrating that, which the ego didn't consider you to be. So casting more light onto the whole of life. Now, if you allow me to make a couple of remarks here, please, um, I first, I, I would proposed that the differentiation of these phases into first half of life and second half of life is not entirely accurate. It's often interpreted as that, but I think it's more an ongoing process. In some aspect of your life, um, from a certain time on, some aspects of your life, you're further along from this, this development than in others. In some aspects, you're already trying to integrate. In some aspects, you're still trying to build a firm standing. And so, so it's a, in, in a healthy sort of development. It's, I would say it's, it's a, it's a process that's always interdependent. Maybe after this process of integrating something, you have to build a little bit of ego strength again, because it's difficult and painful to integrate. Right. Um, and that's, so that's number one. And number two is, um, I don't think individuation can ever be fulfilled or achieved. And this leads us to the alchemical request, I'd say, right. Where, where gold has never been found. Um, and it leads to the alchemical request because individuation is not only dependent on you. It, 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 the idea that the microcosm and the macro, macro, macrocosm have to be sort of, again, consolidated, they fall together. Whatever I do, the world depends on and whatever the world does, I depend on. So it's also a lot related to the 
becoming, getting in tune and into resonance with this collective space, which is in the end a collective space. I think often individuation thread is this process that I can just go through myself and I can sit here and draw a mandala and everything, so it's fine. And, but I don't, I don't, I don't believe, I don't see it that way. You know, I see that as a bigger and unfulfillable quest in the end. Yeah, I, I'm really glad that you took the time to explain that. And uh, th that was something that I, I really learned a lot, gained a lot of for your course at the Global Center for Advanced Studies on Jung, which, which by the way, is that course archived? Can people take it uh, as an archive course yeah. or do they have to take it live? No, it's, it's archived. You can take it as an archive course. You can send me send me um, email. I can put my email in the chat. Um, I can get give you access. Um, okay. Or um, you can take it next year. It's going to happen again next year. We'll, we may have a, we may even have um, a, a live course on Jung in the um, in in the Alps, in the Austrian Alps, but um, mm -hmm. in the Alps uh, coming up next fall. So, but but that um, yeah, uh, amazing, yes. amazing, because uh, because in that course I, again, I'm often I have read Jung, but I haven't read Jung in in a long, long time. And uh, a lot of times I get second, third hand Jung. I get uh, sometimes a more pop culture Jung, uh, the, for want of a better word, uh, new age Jung, uh, new age misunderstandings of Jung. So I think there, there is a really common idea out there that this individuation is, is permanent. It's almost like a, a secular enlightenment, right? Or what people think of as Buddhist enlightenment. You, be, you become sort of a um, it almost, um, maybe superhuman is, is a bit of an over exaggeration, but you become this completely peaceful at ease, uh, um, secularly divine creature. Right. And in, in your reading of Jung, that, that, that's not what happens. First of all, I don't think that will happen, even if you would be individuated, because in the end, individuation is, I, I think a lot of these differently start start differently. A lot of these images are display people that are very complying with everything that's going on. You know, it's like, oh, everything's all right. And, and that's an attitude that's great. But in the end, it's a complying attitude. I think the process of realizing itself is on the one hand, in integration with the collective. On the other hand, though, it's, it's also in integration with your aspect of that. So it's, it, you become yourself and a confident version of yourself, which means that you will obviously, confidence always needs, again, you can't get rid of the shadow, even if your light grows that big. You can't get rid of it. Um, and, 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 um, perhaps that would also be hubris. You know, if you want to get rid of this, if you want to get rid of darkness entirely, what you're essentially saying is you want to control everything you want to, because that's what the ego always think, right? It takes control. Yeah. And, um, so I think both of these extremes don't apply, right? On the one hand, the ego, you can't let go of the ego. That's also common new agey sort of, sort of interpretation is like, oh, like, or yeah, you can't, because that's literally the fundament of communicating, of living in the world and existing, even in a world that is, even if you live in isolation, you still have, you still have to sort of narrate yourself through the day, if you will, you know, you still need to get up and you need to, you know, I think it's an interesting image, you know, but the realization of the self only happens in death. I read it somewhere, you know, you can only, only the moment you, like your, your ego sort of, or infinity, perhaps, you know, perhaps psychotics were much closer to three hours. Psychotics will have a lot of access, very direct access to the, to the collective unconscious, right? Because there's no ego barrier, but, but that's not what you want to, you know, that's not the images you see. You see those, you know, everything's going to be all right and you'll be fine, which is literally what people want to hear. And I don't think that there's a lot of, a lot we want to hear to be found in the process of individuation. Yeah, no, no, that, that, that's awesome. Thanks so much. So I, I'm not jumping in with a lot of comparisons and connections to to Gnostic thought to Gnosticism because because I think that's going to be a different show um with the uh this show is so important because it, I'll, I'm going to be linking this show as as the prelude so that people will be well versed in Jung but that said uh you know I, I do want to bring in some some esoterica as something that, that a lot of people are going to think of as, as mystical which is alchemy, which we've actually mentioned a few times, but you know, wasn't he inspired by alchemy and it isn't alchemy. Like th that's a bunch of silly superstition, right? It's about crazy people who are ignorant. They're trying to turn lead into gold. How could that inspire young class? Right. I, I think, I think in the first place, the alchemical quest was quite, um, it was quite interesting, right? Because I think for the alchemist, it wasn't only the, 
idea that at some point all the metals would be purified into sort of a a a the purest metal gold and gold also being a symbol for conscious right for 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 sort of for, for for the divine if you will right silver so pure and and I, I think that but on the other hand the alchemical quest for Jung and this is how he read it was precisely the, a, a metaphor for the for the process of individuation he thought that. The alchemist, the alchemical quest was actually a psychological quest, the quest that was externalized, projected into the material, right? Projected onto the, the matter that they were dealing with. And the retorts of the, well, well, the vessel in which they were working was actually, is actually the psyche, right? That for young that the interpretation. And, um, again, we see this in the impossibility of the achievement of, of the alchemical quest, right? The impossibility of the achievement of individuation. We see this in many of the operations. We have a, a, a long interpretation. It's also, it's in, in, I think in the GCAS class, I, I mentioned some of the um, different phases. Um, but you have um, a lot a lot reflected here, and, and that's why Jung uses alchemy as sort of this, this fundament um, of this, or one of the fundamental readings of the individuation process. Yeah. So uh, you have an interesting academic background, an, an interesting career background, but but you have done some some academic study of of psychology, uh, what we call modern scientific psychology, and and hasn't Jung's work been proven to be false? Uh, isn't uh, doesn't modern psychology just com more or less completely say it's a bunch of of, of bunk? If I mean it, again, I think um, first the depends on what you mean by true and false, right? I think I think there is the modern psychology has a certain Perspective and within that perspective, within that scientific worldview, you can um, test certain hypotheses. And even assuming that the tests that we do have or bear truth or are transferable to the real world, first in their statistic methods and second in their in their sort of um, well, let's say in their applicability in general, um, there's still a space for let's say work that is um, not concerned specifically with this. Space. You know, Jung was concerned with the, with a, with hypotheses that are, let's say, beyond ego psychology. That's, I think, precisely what he wanted to go beyond. And, mm -hmm. and most of modern psychology works on that level of ego psychology. And I, I don't want to go into, I mean, you can, you can now say that, you know, quantum physics confirms some of the hypotheses that Jung had on, on, on the, you know, the collective unconscious being the, the shared layer of meaning, you know, the, the you will ask like monist interpretation. And that's certainly an interesting path for someone's oh, interest yeah. in that. I mean, you could read some of the work, um, the works on, on dual aspect monism, um, and you know, how that much, uh, wrote some, wrote some books on that. Um, that's an interesting read, certainly. And if you read further into synchronicity, Marie-Louise from France, uh, one of your students, um, he developed synchronicity a lot further and the idea that sort of, again, psyche and matter are simply one and they, they're interdependent and so on. And, and you have, you do have also, I mean, Something we know for, for in psychology is that we're, the actions that we take are preceded by, um, by brain activity, if, if we can, if we could measure stuff on this level, right? But it, but it's, that's something we, something we, we have confirmed as an hypothesis and, um, and, and that tells us something about the autonomy that we have about and over our action and tells us something about sort of the, um, yeah, let's say the, yeah, the, you know, the. The question what steers or or how dependent we are on certain pre-existing structures and now you again if you if you are if you stay at a very naturalistic level material materialist level you can say that that the 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 nature that we encounter and the culturation that we that we receive are but the precisely open nature that we encounter are the fundament of these arch of these archetypal sort of templates or or trajectories that we then live out now, you don't have to, I think you don't have to be a metaphysician to read Jung. There's, there's a book by, um, it's Anthony Stevens, um, cool. Yeah. Uh, the natural history of the self. And that, that talks a lot about this sort of materialist approach to the, to understanding the archetypes and, and a lot from psychology behaviorism as well. So that's an interesting entry point. Absolutely. Um, do you feel, you, you know, personally, professionally, philosophically, is, is, is Jung's work neatish in, in the modern day in some vital way? Right. 
I think in many ways, I think first, and perhaps the main reason why it's needed is because a lot of Jung prompts us to take a look at what is around us, you know, to, to recognize ourselves within the actions that we take and the actions that others take and to recognize us as, um, interdependent with other people, with our history, with our future and our past and our present, excuse me. So, um, on that level, simply speaking, you have a lot in sort of the ecological crises that were, that were perhaps existing in, um, and sort of humanitarian crisis that resist, and you have a lot of hope in your, or a lot of perspectives on that. There is also, I think on the individual level, um, a great let's say, chance in your own, to move away from a framework where you think you have your own destiny in your own hand and you can say, well, I have to achieve everything. You know, I, there are these imperialist goals that I have to achieve. Certainly again, that's on, on one, on one level, that is what you, that is what you go through. That is what you have to do within the framework that we live in. It would be our, uh, in your words, but move away, turn away from that. But Jung gives us the hope that there is something beyond that, that there's something else that, that has to be integrated, something else that's calling for us. It, it, mm. something other, let's say truly in the, in the, in the true sense of the word, you know, something other that is not again, ourselves, I think classical psychoanalysis is like, oh yeah, you can cover, um, something else in the unconscious, but then again, it only kind of yourself and plus a little bit, you know, um, and, and for Jung, it's like, no, no, there's, there's actually something else here. And, and I think on a very very mundane level, it is worthwhile studying these products of the psyche precisely because they are so deeply woven into, into what we are as a collective. And if you believe in the collective unconscious, the term being in metaphysical, but it doesn't, doesn't, it's not really relevant. It's simply, you know, if you, if you look at these sources and you think, well, the people that have preceded that have lived on, 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 on this earth before me have written this and they have had a reason to for some, somehow they somehow produced this, right. For some, somehow this had to do with the way they, you, they structured the world around them. Isn't there some reason to believe that this has some application to me, right? Some, some effect on me. Like, don't I see the world similarly on a very fundamental level? I think, I think that's, that's what Jung brings to the table beyond, you know, the classical, okay, well ask questions about yourself, reflect on yourself and so on and so forth. That, that psychology would follow well. Uh, absolutely. So we, uh, the, we mentioned GCAS, uh, the global center for advanced studies. I, uh, the, for the people watching at home, I've, I've put up your bio from their homepage. Uh, it's where I'm doing uh, my master's in psychoanalysis. You not only teach there, but you're the director of the psychoanalysis MA program. Now uh, the, an impression I, I would say it, it's fair to say that both I and, and others have uh, of GCAS is that they're really big on Lacan. Really, really yeah. big on Lacan. Um, <laughs> thought of, of Jung and Lacan opposed? I think many would say yes, right? Lacanian, th I mean, the papers by Lacanian saying, oh yeah, Jung's just, self is just a super singing bar. No, but I, I, think, I think they work in two different levels. I think that's the fundament um, that we have here, right? Jung worked on, um, on the level, again, going beyond the personal level. And like Tom stays on this level of the personal, of the, the, the personal conscious, he's not concerned with the collective. Um, and, and I think that's a chance, right? If you go beyond these, the, the obvious existing differences, the obvious interpretation uh, in, in consequences for therapy, the obvious different techniques, you know, you could say on a theoretical level, um, I see them as a great addition. I like reading Lacan and I like, I like studying in, in uh, Lacan. It's interesting. I'm not as proficient in Lacan as others are and, and certainly not as proficient as I am in Jung, but, but it is, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting to see if you have a supplementary perspective on this sort of personal level, because honestly, Jung's work is, I think, very, very strong on this sort of, on this, on this deeper level. And then you can interpret, interpret and, um, and um, implication of the, of the personal level, especially the ego, but, um, there's a lot of clinical literature on Lacan, which Jung simply doesn't really, doesn't really have himself free to that extent. So I think they're not, but again, I think at GCAP, we're, we're definitely, the Jungians are, the, or, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if they're Jungians in a plural at GCAP, um, but, but some of the, some of the people now in the MA are, are interested in, in Jung. I think it's sort of a, we're still a shadow function. And I think that's, and, I, and that's great, you know, again, like different forces have to compensate each other and 
again, in the end, form a whole that people can then, you know, use, use to, for whatever they want to do. Yeah, yeah, it's very appropriate for thinkers all about reconciling opposites. I, I think some exciting <laughs> things will come out of these uh, these intellectual discussions and uh, the meetings of, of uh, the different schools might be too harsh of a term, but you know what I mean, which is it, it, I've been putting uh, Klein new publications up on the uh, the screen for, for everybody at home. You have a number of uh, books uh, that, that you've published. Everybody should go out and buy them. I do want to have you back on the show to talk about those books particularly so, the um, the dynamic of the psyche, the process of transformation in the I Ching and Tao Te Ching, uh, because I think our watchers and listeners will, will get a lot out of that. But, but but tell us about your book. Tell us about where people can find you online and tell us about your new YouTube channel. Thanks for the space, first of all. And I think, especially the YouTube channel, what I try to do is simply, what I've also tried now is to, to say, okay, well, here's, here's what Jung said. Not necessarily always subjectively, certainly I interpret, but... Um, an interpretation that it's not on the spiritual side, you know, that, that some new age stuff is on and then not leading towards the Jordan Peterson side that I think is very prominent on YouTube, that is, you know, mm -hmm. going in the direction of you have to go out, take responsibility for everything and, and, you know, build, build, a, build you know, build a, build meaning and, and create meaning. I don't, I fundamentally don't think meaning can be created. Um, mm -hmm. so, so that is, um, the. That is sort of the, the, the aim of the YouTube channel, but a lot of that is sort of true reading of young detailed, ex detailed discussions of, um, the dynamics of the psyche. Again, you know, the interaction of the ego and the collective unconscious, I think that's what Jung is always concerned with. Um, and there's, there's also what a lot of the books are on one of, one of the books on social media, um, that's maybe an interesting perspective for some and, um, how that ties into the sort of cutting us off from essentially the influences of the um, the collective or interactions with that collective and leaving us sort of a hubris situation, the ego and the situation of hubris. Um, and obviously there's the book on the, the EJ where it was more of sort of a meditative, um, self consciousness, um, rather than an analysis, a deep held word by word analysis, but, uh, it was quite a good exercise, I think. And, and then, um, and always within the network, the first book I wrote is, um, on so this journey of the subject or the individual, um, between these sort of three world reigns around uh, sort of the heaven, the archetypes, and then hell reality and coming into being in this, in the in-between space, let's say, which, uh, which um, yeah. Perfect. So yeah, so you have a then take it here if you like to talk. Amazing. I'm, I'm going to quickly wrap up with a commercial for ourselves, Patreon slash, patreon.com slash Gnostic. You can keep the show going for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. That's per piece of media. You can also put a cap on that. Just give us a dollar. Uh, other people who have podcasts and Patreons, we also have to update the Patreon. We have old information on there. Did they give you stuff? We we, we don't we don't give you anything. We give you love um, because we both want to create extra content and lock it up behind the paywall is the idea. And I can't think of anything else to give people for signing up for the Patreon. But if I do, uh, you'll get it. Uh, we do give the shows out early whenever I remember and have time. Uh, we're trying to be as professional as possible, people. But at the same time, uh, there is a limit to our professionalization, uh, both because of, of time commitments, but also it's not what we're about. The, we want to be serious. We want to have serious thinkers. We want to get it out there, but it's, it's not a money-making enterprise for us. That said, we do need a little bit of help to keep the show going. If you can help us, uh, please do. And if you can't, that's cool, too. Actually, if you can and you like the show, just tell people about it, rate, review. I know you hear that. You Apparently, there's other podcasts out there. I'm disgusted by the idea. So you've probably heard this rate and review, but it, it feeds the algorithm gods, the algorithm archons. You can do uh, one-time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic. And uh, th that brings us to the end. The end for now, Florian. It's been awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks to Thanks so much for coming on uh, the, 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 at night before bedtime at your time. So it, it, it's been really awesome. Thank you very much, Brian. Okay, bye, everybody.